I want to continue talking about um, periodic uh, oscillations, periodic uh, orbits, and we'll talk about something called subcritical hop bifurcations. Once again, funny name, um, but I'll explain what it means. Uh, who can tell me again what we did last time? What was a hop bifurcation again? So you have a nonlinear system that does what again? So recall, and we call them uh, hop by themselves. Those are the most commonly uh, studied ones, but really they're called supercritical hop. Critical hop. And those are systems that look like y prime equals f of y comma a or p where p is a parameter and that for some values of p have this fun property which is that there exists some periodic solution of the system but it's not it's not like the periodic solutions we we used to see in in, in previous models like this like in the a lot of Volterra model. It's more like it's more like this. It's not like there's a whole bunch of solutions, one you know, nested inside the other. It's more like there's a single solution, and that single solution attracts solutions nearby. Okay, so this is called a limit cycle. OK, now, um, in general, proving the existence of periodic solutions is very hard in a dynamical system. So this is one of the few uh, tricks that we have, that we've learned, to prove the existence of such solutions. There's other ones, especially for two-dimensional systems. If we have time, we'll talk about them. But this is one that can be generalized to multiple dimensions. That's why I'm especially interested in it. So now, but that was supercritical hop bifurcations. Now let's talk about subcritical hop bifurcations. Critical hop theorem. It's also due to the same three guys as before, Andronov, Hop, and uh, Poincare, and it's very very similar to the previous one. So I'm going to write it down, and you can tell me what is different from the previous theorem. It's, it's very, very similar. So given a dynamical system, y prime equals f of y comma and, and then a parameter, suppose that first uh, y bar is a steady state for every p. And remember, we, we can also relax this and say that for every p, there's just one y bar of p, that you can depend on p, you know, because the system changes a little bit if you change the value of p. So presumably, the steady state can change a little bit. That, that's fine. The second condition is that the linearization around p um, has the following properties. There's some value, p equal p0, where the eigenvalues are right on the imaginary line. And when you height, when you make p a little bit higher, they, the eigenvalues cross the imaginary line. And when p, uh, the value of p is a little bit lower, they, they go you know, they go further to the left or further to the right. Basically, as you increase the value of the parameter p, you cross the imaginary line. That's, that's what the statement. It's a little bit hard to write. So basically, what I'm doing is I'm writing what happens when p is slightly less than p0. You're over here. And when p is slightly more than p0, the eigenvalues are over here. So they essentially move towards the right and cross the imaginary line. That's the second condition. Okay? 
Uh, and the third condition, can anybody tell me what the third condition was in the previous theorem? Patrick. Um, F P0, the um, OK. Okay, let me just say unstable, because I think last time I just said stable. So number three here is the opposite. Let's suppose that it's not stable, it's unstable. It's either one or the other, right? You know that the behavior of the system is like a spiral. So it's either a spiral that is stable or it's spiral that is unstable, especially in two dimensions, right? It either converges towards the steady state or it converges away from the steady state. So the first case is the first theorem, and the second case is the second theorem. So what this, what this means is that with the two theorems together, you can essentially eliminate this, this assumption because it's either one or the other. If it's one, you apply one theorem. If it's the other, you apply the other theorem. So really the only, I mean, and this kind of is like an, it's almost like a non-assumption, right? Fine, there's a steady state that's not that hard to assume. Really the only assumption is this thing, this number two, that the eigenvalues cross the, the imaginary line, okay? Um, so the conclusion, um, <clears throat> then there is a periodic solution of the system for all P in the following interval. P0 minus epsilon to P0 for some epsilon. Okay, so there exists some sm small epsilon and such that in this, whole, in this whole interval, there's always a periodic solution. Now that periodic solution is not gonna be the same as before. It's gonna look a little bit different. Let me tell you the, the, the phase diagram of this situation here. Okay, so for P equal P0, we have what behavior again at the around the steady state? Brian, <laughs> it's unstable, right? Okay, for P bigger than P0, what can we say? Well, remember we said, you know, two, right? Number two says something about the eigenvalues for P bigger than P0. They look like this, right? So what does a system look like that has these eigenvalues? It's an unstable spiral, that's right. And by the way, by this, this point here, I mean the point Y bar, right? Okay, <clears throat> all right, and now what happens with the, this is now the interesting case, is P less than P zero. Well, what does the linearization suggest? That it's a stable spiral, right? So locally around the steady state, it's a stable spiral. Okay, but what happens? <clears throat> In a sense, this tells you some information about the system. There are some arrows that are essentially pointing away. And when you make P slightly, just ever so slightly less than P0, you're changing these arrows so that over here, they're now pointing inside. But those arrows outside stay pointing outside, towards the outside. So there are arrows that are pointing outside, or there are arrows that are pointing inside. In the middle, you get this periodic solution. Okay, that's kind of that's kind of the intuition of the of the of the theorem. <coughs> so this is something uh, actually new. We haven't talked about this too much. This is what we can call, I don't know what you, what you want to call it. It's almost like a limit cycle, but it's not stable. It's unstable, right? 
It's like an unstable limit cycle. But guess what? It's still oscillations. If we wanted to prove oscillations, you know, there you have it. We can prove the existence of oscillations. And actually, these systems have a nice property that I think is more relevant in engineering than in biology. I mean, I'm sure there's also biological examples. But I can give you a nice example of when this can happen in engineering. That's actually an interesting behavior. So let's, let's do an example of this thing. Uh, do you guys have any questions about the theorem, the, the statement of the theorem itself? Nelson, no? OK. So example. And I could use. Remember that last time we did an example, we used polar coordinates. And we essentially took some time to turn the system into a system in polar coordinates and then studied it. So because the system is, this example is going to be a little more complicated, I'm not even going to bother with the rectangular coordinates. I'm just going to write it in polar coordinates. OK? And you know, by writing use polar coordinates. Um, if you wanted to write it using co rectangular coordinates, you can always do that. You can always change it so that it's written in terms of uh, rectangular uh, coordinates. So basically, we have the, co uh, the variables theta and r. And I'm going to give you an equation for theta and an equation for r. And, um, and the equation for r is pr plus r to the 3 times 1 minus r squared. And this one is, let's say, some number, w plus r to r squared. OK. I don't particularly care how fast the, um, the angle is changing over time. As long as it's changing, notice this thing is always bigger than 0, right? Let's say that, let's say that this, guy, this guy, omega, is bigger than 0. So the further away you are from the center, the faster you go. OK? Doesn't matter. Whatever. Really what, I'm care, what I care about is this, uh, the, be, the, the behavior of the radius. Is the radius becoming larger and larger, or is it becoming smaller and smaller? If the radius is becoming smaller and smaller, that means that you're converging towards 0, right? If, what happens if the radius converges to 1, for example? So if the radius becomes closer and closer to 1, and uh, let's say this is always 1 or whatever. It doesn't matter. This is always something positive. What is the behavior of the system? There's oscillations, right? OK, exactly. So, so there you go. You can see the behavior of the system by just looking at what happens with, with this. All right. Now, um, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's point out what happens for different values of p. So phase diagrams. The, the easiest case is the case p is equal to 0. That's our p0, OK? p0 is just 0. So we set this guy equal to 0, and we get, we get r prime equals r to the 3 times 1 minus r squared. That's the same thing as 1 minus r, 1 plus r, right? So what are the steady states of such a system? Um, Krista. R equals zero, yes. Um, what else? One That's right. Zero, one, and minus one. Okay. Now, what does the function itself look like? This this function over here. We know that it it has it's some kind of polynomial, right? And it goes through this point, to this point, through this point. Okay. All right. So this generally looks like what? What what degree does it have? Five, 5 degree, right? So the general shape of this thing should be roughly the one of minus r to the 5. That's the dominating uh, uh, monomial, right? So minus r to the 5 would look something like, minus r to the 5 would look something like this. Right? This would be minus r to the 5. Uh, this term in here, you know, minus r to the 5 plus r to the 3. This r to the 3 is going to change it a little bit. So it's changing it so that now it, it goes to these points over here. OK? 
Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna spare you the details, but basically, how do you change this thing so that it now goes through this point and this point? More like this, right? Exactly. Now. Notice that around zero, this is roughly equal to r to the three, so it's still flat. You can calculate the derivative at zero, and obviously the derivative at zero is zero. So it's a still a flat function, but it has to go, still a flat function, but it has to go through these points. So like this, and like that, up, oh, sorry, and like, and like this. Okay? All right. So this is kind of a tricky function to, pl to plot, but there you go. That's what it is. All right, so now what happens when p is bigger than zero? Uh, by the way, is, this, is it clear what I'm drawing here? Do you guys agree? Yes? Okay, fine. I mean, this is really just calculus, calculus one, right? I mean, you can, you can draw this by looking at the, the form formula, and that's it. Now, when I add a term pr to this function, how does it change? I'm just adding PR, right? No, remember that R is, you know, this is not a constant term, right? It's P times R, right? I'm essentially adding a function, PR. This is the function PR, right? And I'm adding both functions, right? So overall, this thing gets shifted, right? It's it kind of like rotated a little bit like this. So now, instead of being flat, it's more or less like this at the origin. And then it still goes like this. And it still goes like this. OK? And what happens when, um, you know what? It doesn't really matter what, what the function is doing for negative r. I don't, I, don't even, I don't even need to draw that, because a negative r is not even going to going to show up so let's let's not even worry about what happens with uh, with negative r so this is r and this is r prime what happens with what happens when p is less than 0 so now pr looks like this right and when we add pr we get this function shifted down right so it's more like this All right, good. So now let's look at the steady states. This guy has three steady states. This one I'm not even going to look at because r is neg never negative. In polar coordinates, it doesn't matter, right? So now what happens with this system over time? If I start with some initial condition, does r become bigger, smaller? Uh, let's see, uh, Jonathan, can you tell me what happens with this system over time? If I start with some initial condition, does it converge to what does it do? You guys should know this by now. You know, it's a one-dimensional system. We've done many of these. Okay, this steady state is what? Stable or unstable? Stable, stable right? And this one here is? Unstable. unstable. So solutions that start, say, over here, converge towards this point, which happens to be 1, right? And solutions that start over here converge towards 1, like this, right? What about this system? Is this one? This is not exactly one, but it's almost one, right? Mm -hmm. Solutions are also stable around this point. And what about this one here? OK, but there's something else, right? There's a new steady state here. So this system has this steady state, which is unstable. This steady state is stable or unstable? Stable. And this one is stable too, right? And the solutions do like this, right? OK, great. So now knowing what happens with R, we can make a, a diagram of what happens with the actual system, not just R, but the actual system. So let's see, for P equal to 0, what do we have? We have a periodic solution, just like Patrick said, of radius 1. Right? And that periodic solution is stable or unstable? In other words, if you start over here, 
if you start over here, you're going to converge towards that periodic solution? Yes, right? OK. And if you start over here, it's also stable, right? It, the solutions go towards r equals 1. OK. What happens when um, p is bigger than 0? Well, more or less the same thing. There's some, there's some periodic solution that is almost, almost uh, radius 1. And it's also stable. So it's pretty much the same thing. But what happens when p is less than 0 is more interesting. We still have a stable periodic solution with radius roughly equal to 1. So this guy is still there. But we also have an unstable periodic solution with this radius over here. We have this new periodic solution with this small radius. And solutions that start over here go towards the inside. Solutions that start over here go towards the outside. OK? You can tell what the system looks like just by looking at the radius over time. The radius starts changing. And it's always oscillating, so that's how it behaves. All right, so that's how it behaves. So you can see, if we, if we bother to look at the linearizations around the origin, you would see that over here, they have positive eigenvalues, or positive real parts. Over here, they have negative real parts. And over here, they transition from being negative to positive. And the point 0, 0 is a steady state of the system. So you have, so 1. It's obvious. If you, look, if you look at that diagram over there, you can see that y bar equals 0, 0 is a steady state. You can see from the behavior of the system that if you bother to linearize, you would have this behavior. Now, you cannot just linearize here. You would have to go back to the uh, rectangular coordinates. And it would be a, a, really would be a kind of a pain, right? But you could do it. And that would be the result because you can see what it does. Okay. And now what happens with this third condition? At p equals at p, equal, uh, p zero, uh, the system is unstable. Is it satisfied in this case? It's satisfied, right? You can see it's unstable at p equals 0. All right? And you can see that the conclusion of the theorem is satisfied. Suddenly, lo and behold, there, is, there appeared this additional um, unstable periodic solution. This is the one that exists because of the, of the theorem. You could, in principle, you could set a theorem, you know, have a theorem that does not have this big oscillation, that only has a small one over here. Okay? Now, but why do I, why do I bother with this, with this one? Because it's, you know, um, well, let me, t let me tell you why. So, but let me first ask, are there any questions on the behavior of the system? Yes? Is it possible to construct a system such that uh, beta prime would matter? Like, there would be a point in beta prime such that it such that the steady um, It would be possible, but if we're talking about periodic oscillations, I mean, as long as theta is always positive, it's not really going to do much, right? Because it's, it's going to keep oscillating. If you want theta to do something interesting, maybe you can have some point where theta becomes 0 and then it stops oscillating, right? This, I mean, by the way, these are all cooked, cooked, cooked up examples. You know, these are examples that are easy to set up so that you can see, illustrate the, the, the results. Um, but you can, you know, in real life, you have other systems that are not polar coordinates where you also have interesting behavior. So I think to answer your question here, it's not so much that I'm interested in about. I'm not, I'm not so interested necessarily in, in finding some system where theta is sometimes zero or negative or, or positive or so. Uh, but or we're already restricting it quite a bit by, by writing in this notation, right? in, a, in a sense, right? Um, yeah. uh, okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. So now let's think about what happens when, um, when p changes. So so I'm going to write the value of p. And then I'm going to write over here on the y-axis, I'm going to write the quote unquote steady state values of, let's say, the variable x. So by x, I mean the x component of this, of this oscillation, right? So this is x and this is y. All 
All right. So, what are the 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 possible values of x for let's say for uh, this system over here, p equals zero? Okay. X is going to go all the way from let's say one to minus one and then back, right? So I can write this in some kind of diagram form. This is one and this is minus one, and I go kind of back and forth between the two. Okay, this is some kind of like, supposed to be some kind of summarized description of what the system is doing. And for p equals zero, the values of x are oscillating between minus one and one. So let's draw it in, in that way. Okay, when x becomes larger, well, sorry, when p becomes larger, you have also a very big oscillation that goes between something like one, you know, something approaching one and something approaching minus one. And what happens when, um, when p is negative. So if you start, say, with x uh, very small, like over here, then what happens with the solution of x over time? It goes to zero. It goes to zero. That's right. OK. OK. So what it means is that as long as p is negative, if you, if you have a, 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 the value of x is small, it's going to converge towards 0. And the moment that p becomes positive, then x blows up all the way to minus 1 to 1. OK, now, now think, about, think about an application. Suppose that you have a machine, and you're trying to, um, you know, this machine is like moving around, and it's you know, doing its thing. And you're, the machine is supposed to do something, like, I don't know, like a power generator. And it's got a lot of moving parts. And it's also got a bunch of parts that are not supposed to move very much. So you're interested in minimizing vibrations, right? Or think of a, I don't know, a plane, for example, right? A plane has a lot of parts that are moving, but a lot of parts that are not supposed to move. They're supposed to stay where they are. Uh, a lot of the time, you want, as an engineer, you want to minimize vibrations. Suppose that you have a system where some, you know, P in this case stands for some environmental parameter. For example, the temperature of the machine, or how much pressure you're putting on something, or how much you're doing in some other part of the machine. And the value of x, x is, one, is going to indicate one of the coordinates, one of the parts of your machine. So suppose that you, 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 you push x a little bit, and you see it goes back to 0. So in other words, you're eliminating vibrations. You know, there's no vibrations. But if you change something slightly, for example, if the temperature changes, or if you push the machine just a little bit further in some direction, then suddenly you see huge direction. You see a huge uh, vibrations on x. Okay? So that's, that's the situation that is happening here. You have a system that is very stable. You know, if you push x a little bit, it will re return back to the origin. So you think, ah, the system is stable. But if something changes to the system, then it becomes very much unstable. This is, this is the idea behind it. You can have a system that is very much stable, but if you change p, then it becomes very much unstable. Okay? Um, the case of, for comparison, the, this is now, this is now super, no, subcritical. Up. For comparison, we can make a bifurcation diagram for a supercritical hop. And that bifurcation diagram would look more like, like this. You have for p less than 0, or p less than p0, whatever it is, you have a stable steady state. Okay, And then as p becomes bigger than p0, you have a stable periodic solution. So x starts, for example, when, when p has this value over here, x starts oscillating between this point and this point, back and forth. Okay. And, and so on and so forth. So this will be the, the corresponding graph for the supercritical half bifurcation. So if you make, in the, in, the, in the context of a machine, if you have a machine that is operating with this value of p, and it's therefore stable, and you push it so that it now operates at this level, you're going to see a small vibration appearing in the system. And as you increase the value of p, the vibration is going to get bigger and bigger. Okay. But the, you're going to go from a stable system to a system, with, to a system with a small vibration. You're not going to get from a stable system to a system that has a huge vibration right away. So in a sense, that one is more dangerous in terms of engineering. 
All right, great. Questions? Yes, Patrick. So if you, if you were to perturb the system beyond that dotted uh, parabola, it would then hop to the uh, yes. constellation? Yes, yes, very true. So this, I'm not drawing it because I don't want to make this graph too busy. But in fact, for p less than, uh, than 0, you still have this large um, oscillation. If, and if you push, just like you said, if you pushed x beyond the dotted line, you would make x, x go between minus 1 and 1. OK, that's a good point. Thanks. Any other questions? OK. All right. So. So now let me tell you something else. How much time do we have? Oh. Um, so, so now the question is, how, how do these things stack up in real life? Does it show up a lot that you have periodic oscillations or limit cycles? And um, we were just talking about chemical reactions for a long time, right? So let's think about oscillations in chemical reactions. So what do you think? Can, I, can you write down a chemical reaction that starts oscillating on its own? Well, we saw that chemical reactions are nonlinear, right? So in principle, there's no reason why not. But in fact, when you take a bunch of chemicals and you have them <coughs> react, usually what you see is that they just converge to some steady state. You know, you let the thing settle down, and it does its thing, and it, that's it. You don't see them oscillating around. In fact, yes? What's that? What about like a clockwork reaction where it like oscillates from one chemical to the other one back and forth until it eventually converges? Okay. That's nice. So, I mean, you would think that you, you, that should be possible, right? Mm -hmm. So there's these two different conflicting views in a sense because on the one hand side we can think about as mathematicians there should be some, some chemical reaction that you can dream up that oscillates. But on the other hand, as chemical engineers, people usually assume that things settle down. <clears throat> Industrial, you know, chemical, chemical chemists, you know, usually just say, well, just mix it in, let it settle down. They don't think about things go oscillating, and in fact, they very rarely do in in, uh, in industrial applications. You want your chemical reaction to be boring, right? In some sense, I mean, because you want to kind of deal with it, you want to produce some some chemical or something, so you want your reactions not to, you don't want to mess around with the reactions too much, with the dynamics of the reactions. But that's in, that's in engineering. It's very different in, in, in biology. So in biology, you can have, in principle, you can dream up a pathological, strange reaction that can oscillate. Okay? And then you can actually use this, you know, as evolutionarily speaking, you can use these oscillations for your own purposes. For example, this uh, circadian rhythm is an oscillatory chemical reaction. Remember we talked about this, right? Bunch of proteins interacting with each other, uh, protein inhibiting its own production, and after a while, you end up having this oscillatory behavior. So we are we observe these chemical reactions that oscillate in biology. So what gives? Can we have oscillatory chemical reactions? The answer is yes. And the first uh, the first the first such systems that so such system that appeared, I believe, was in the 1960s. A guy called Bielosov, was a Russian guy. No wonder, because there's so many Russians doing these things. Um, started, you know, came up with this reaction and, and, and observed that things were oscillating. And he, he told his colleagues, and they didn't want to believe him. They thought he was, he was crazy and that he was doing something wrong and that it couldn't possibly be right that a chemical reaction oscillates. But as a matter of fact, he was right. And, and now that's, that's a well-known um, uh, uh, reaction. So this is the Bielusov. And then another guy came in that studied it more under better conditions. They, people actually believed him. Uh, I believe this is like 1960s or so, but I'm not, not quite sure. But I would encourage you guys to look this up on YouTube. And maybe we could even, if we have time, we, maybe we could even uh, um, pull up a, do you guys want to do that? You want to see this in, I mean, a video? Yeah. yeah, let's do it. Let's check it out. Cool. 
so it actually has this this spatial pattern to it, right? You know, it, it actually forms traveling traveling patterns. We did not talk about spatial chemical or spatial anything, you know, yet in this course. But if you, I think, I think you stay for uh, one thirteen uh, C, you're gonna start talking about dynamics in space. You know, variables that are different in different parts of space. And in this case, you you see this kind of like waves of, of chemicals traveling around. Um, and of, I mean, if you look at a, at, a, at a single point here, it goes from red to blue and then back, right? And so that's the oscillation. Okay. Does it ever settle, or does it always oscillate? Okay, that's a great question. Does it ever uh, stop, stop, or does it always oscillate? And as a matter of fact, because you know, there's there's some, there's you know, uh, one of the arguments they told um, Bielusov that this couldn't be happening is thermodynamics. You cannot, if you have a chemical reaction that oscillates and just keeps going oscillating forever, then uh, you're essentially violating a principle of thermodynamics that you cannot just have continuous eternal motion by itself. And the way that this is resolved is that this system is actually consuming energy. Okay, so you have to have some energy in, in the in the chemicals there that is actually consumed. So after a while, the energy is depleted and the system doesn't oscillate anymore. So that's, that's, that's a very good point, and that's really what happens. At some point, just things kind of settle down. But that doesn't mean that it's not, not oscillating. For example, in a biological system, you're consuming energy all the time. And so what? You're, you're, you're oscillating, but it's, it's, it's OK, right? So I'm sure you can also see it oscillating in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a glass container, the whole thing, changing color from like blue to yellow. But, you know, but this is, this is, I, I, th I thought this was nicer, because you can see it moving in space, right? All right, so, so that's a chemical reaction that oscillates. And now, how do we prove the existence of such oscillations? You know, how do we prove mathematically that this happens? Or what would be such, would be such a model? And actually, in Leah's book, there's an example of that. And they, do, they carry out a um, time scale decomposition very similar to what I assigned in the homework. So it's a chemical reaction that is a little bit too complicated to study by itself. So you make some assumptions about some reactions being much faster than others, and that way you can simplify the system and, and prove, you know, oscillations and everything. Um, <clears throat> in this case, um, let's look at what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to write down a system of differential equations that are chemical reactions and that oscillate. Okay. So uh, it's not going to be the exact Bielus of Sabotinsky because, because that one's too complicated, but it's going to be a similar one. And, and this is due to a guy called Schnackenberg. Nineteen seventy nine. Very simple. You have two chemicals and Basically, I want to I wanna say, and maybe this is related to what you were saying, Krista, that you have the same chemical that can be in active or inactive form. So let's say that X is active and Y is inactive. So you can take two molecules of the inactive one and activate this one. As you can see, there, you know, if, you, if you think about it that way, then you have conservation of mass. If you think about Y and X as being completely different molecules, then you would have to explain how Y disappeared out of thin air and X came out of nowhere. Right, so I think that maybe the, the better way to put it is like this. That they're the same molecule, different forms. Um, you also have um, Y getting produced and X getting degraded. Okay, and these reactions can be very slow, for example. And we're going to introduce a parameter here. And the other two parameters are just one. So, let's write this down. Let's call this reaction number one, this reaction number two, this reaction number three. So what is this stoichiometry matrix in this system? Um, Daniel, what do you think? So the first reaction, first reaction number one. What is the stoichiometry for X? Let's, let's see. This is a good review, too. How many molecules of X are actually produced in this reaction? One. 
So in the beginning, we have 2x. In the end, we have 3x. So how many did we make? One, right? There was one created, right? Even though there were two, it doesn't matter. This is stoichiometry. If you look at the definition again, is the number of molecules of X that were produced when the reaction took place. So you, you, you made three, but you started with two. So the net number is one, OK? What about Y? Minus one. OK. What about the second reaction? Who wants to try? You want to try, Daniel? Zero and one. Great. And you want to do the next one? Well, I remember that. Negative one. Exactly, right. Negative one. And zero. zero. You got it. Great. OK. So now this is the stoichiometry matrix multiplied by the vector of reaction speeds, right? Now, what is the vector of reaction speeds? Uh, the first reaction, what is the speed of the first reaction? Patrick? It's the arrow. Yeah, this reaction here. Oh, it's a... And this is 1, OK? This is 1 times the product x of. Times y. Exactly. So x squared times y times 1, OK? Uh, Michael, what about the second reaction? OK, so the, the product of, of nothing is 1 times A, just A. And the third reaction, um, Abdon, just X, right? Awesome, you got it. And what is that? So this is 1 times x squared y minus x and that one is the equation for y is minus x squared y plus a minus 0. Okay. So now that means that x prime is x squared y minus x. y prime is equal to minus x squared y <coughs> plus a. OK, great. So that's our system of equations. We have a parameter a. And uh, we have, we're going to do some analysis on this system, especially thinking of the assumptions of the Hopf bifurcation theorem. Number one, number two, number three. Okay? So number one, what is the steady state of the system? And I don't have much time, so let me just tell you. The steady state is a comma one over a. And now that already somewhat violates the assumptions of the theorem, because in the theorem we said that there's only one steady state that works for all A. And here we have a steady state that actually depends on A. But we said it's OK, remember? So it's OK for the steady state to depend on A. That's fine. It all, all it means is that we're going to linearize around something that is changing, right? For different values of A, we're going to linearize around a different steady state. But that's fine. No, no, no problem. OK. so. What is the linearization? OK, so the Jacobian of this system is what? The Jacobian of this system is, uh, Brian. OK. Uh-huh. Minus? No, minus 2x1. Uh huh. Excellent. Thanks. So now we're going to evaluate this thing at a comma 1 over a. By the way, you can verify in your head that this is actually a steady state, right? 
This is a squared times 1 over a is a minus a is 0. And this is minus uh, a plus a is also 0. Great. This thing is equal to 2 minus 1 is 1. OK. And this is a squared. This guy here is minus, minus 2. And this is minus a squared. OK? So now we have to look at the eigenvalues of this thing. And we have to verify whether they look like this. Right? So we, um, I'm just going to tell you the, the actual eigenvalues. It's 1 minus a squared plus or minus square root of 1 minus a squared minus 4a divided by 2. That looks like a mouthful, but you can actually look at what happens for different values of a. And you can see that, for example, when a is equal to, when a is equal to 1, then lambda is equal to 0 plus or minus square root of 0 minus 4 divided by 2. And this is 0 plus or minus, well, actually, this is equal to plus or minus 2i over 2 is equal to plus or minus i. Right? So for a is equal to 1, we are here. OK? Yes? For a slightly less than 1, not all less than 1, but just slightly less than 1, you actually have something that is over here. Why is that? Well, this thing is imaginary. OK, so this, uh, this is still going to be imaginary if we shift it around a little bit, right? It's just not going to be the square root of minus 4a, but it's going to be the square root of something a little bit different, but it's still an imaginary number. And this is going to turn what? Negative or positive? Well, actually, what? <laughs> positive, right? Yeah, never mind. So this is actually positive. OK. And this is negative, right? The imaginary part is still non-zero, and now the real part is negative, OK? So fine, it's not exactly what we were used to, but it doesn't matter. You know, you can think about A as you know, decreasing, increasing, whatever. You can make a change of variables where you define, let's say, B equals to minus A. And then it's going to work the same, right? All right. <clears throat> so we have a hop bifurcation. OK. The last thing we need to check is whether it is a supercritical hop bifurcation or a subcritical hop bifurcation. Right? And that you can do either by tools that you can learn just for two dimensions, like the poincare bennington theorem, which we haven't done, or you can run it in a simulation in your computer, or you can come up with some argument that, to show it. And as a matter of fact, if I remember correctly, this system is um, uh, stable at that point. Stable. Or unstable? Well, actually, you know what? I don't remember. But it's, you know, it's, it's, in, it's in the book. And it's one of the two. OK, so let's just say that because of what we have just checked, one of the two theorems applies. We don't know which one, but one of the two applies. Either one shows the existence of, of periodic oscillations in the system, right? One of them shows them for p less than p0. The other one shows them for p bigger than p0. So one of the two theorems must apply. Therefore, system has oscillations for some 
for some values of A. And that's it. Do you guys have questions? Yes? Can A be 0 or negative? Yes. I mean, there's mathematically, there's no reason why not. Although, I, it would be funny because this is, remember, these are rates of chemical reactions, right? So A equals 0 would be OK, but A negative would be kind of funny, right? But A equals 0 is a real number, so Yeah, A equals 0 would be fine, yes. But it would plot real numbers, so how does it fit the phase diagram? I'm sorry. Or not the phase diagram, the, uh, or yeah. When pull back down the, okay. so for A less than 1, there's like positive imaginary or yeah, but this actually this is for a bigger than zero and less than one. Oh, okay. That's why that's I'm sorry I, I said this but I didn't write it. This is for a slightly less than one. Okay. Oh, that's that's it. Oh. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Sure. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks for putting that out. Uh, right. Okay. See you guys next time.